After looking at how to read letters, I thought I would look at the letters in the book of Revelation, but realized I needed to back up and do a little bit more on Revelation first. Many people today view Revelation as a closed book. This is largely due to three reasons, I think. First, we're unfamiliar with books like these. We just don't write literature like this today, apocalyptic literature. Second, we don't understand the historical situation in which these works were written. What was going on in the churches that John was writing to? And third, the rise of modern views on prophecy focusing on relaying the message of revelation to our contemporary situation today. This creates two problems. It forces the preacher or the interpreter to get really creative with the text because our situation today is so different from that of the first century. As a result, the interpreter has to jump through all kinds of hoops to apply this text to our context today. In the process, this creates a really complex series of codes or references to accomplish this application. What are the four bowls, the seven trumpets? How does this apply? What's that referred to? And so on down the line. And we need to ask the question, would the readers that John was writing to have had any idea at all what these modern interpreters and preachers are saying that the book of Revelation is talking about? Good day and welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris and for the past 20 plus years, I've been teaching in graduate schools and seminaries around the world. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in those institutions and bring it to you on YouTube. My hope is to encourage you in your personal study and exploration of the biblical text. Grab a cup of coffee because in the next couple of videos, I'm going to be diving into what is very often a difficult book to understand, Revelation. If you find these videos helpful and encouraging, there's a couple quick things you can do for me. Subscribe to the channel, smash that thumbs up button, and let your friends know about these videos as well. Thanks. In 1-9, we are told that the author is John. Traditionally, this is assumed to be the Apostle John, and this seems to have pretty solid backing behind it. It fits what we know historically about him. According to the early church fathers, John, along with Jesus' mother Mary, resettled in Ephesus shortly before the destruction and the fall of Jerusalem under the Romans. He appears to have suffered some degree of persecution and was on the island of Patmos because of his faith. Eusebius, the church historian, writes about the author of Revelation, and he says, The beloved disciple of Jesus, John the Apostle and Evangelist, still surviving, governed the churches in Asia after his return from exile on the island and the death of the mission. Normally, a Roman official, a governor or a magistrate, had a wide range of punishments that they could administer to someone. To send someone into exile, like John on the island of Patmos, was one of the most serious tools that they had available to them. To be cut off from your family and friends and community was very, very close to death. You were still alive, but alienated from all that gave you life and purpose. Oftentimes, exile was chosen for individuals who were either rich or held a high social position within that society. If we return to 1-9, we learn that John was exiled because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He doesn't exactly spell out what this entailed. Most likely because of his role as a leader within the church, he was singled out for some altercation or friction between the infant Christian community and the wider city of Ephesus. In the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 21 through 41, we have the riot over Paul's preaching and ministry within the city. It all started with the complaint from one man, Demetrius, a silversmith who made shrines for the goddess Artemis. 
He stirred up others within his guild because they feared a loss in trade if the Christian church grew too large. This led to anger that the temple of Artemis would be neglected. Next thing you know, the city is full of confusion and a full riot. It took the city scribe to quiet things down and disperse the crowds, and Paul ended up not being charged for anything. John may have been the victim of similar fears that this outside religion would disrupt what they believed and would ruin their city and culture. Or it may have been direct charges against what he is teaching. We're not sure, but one of the things we do know is that to be accused of some crime before the Roman authorities was something that could lead to dire consequences, whether the charges were true or not. The second question that we should answer is, when was Revelation written? There seems to be two primary dates that most New Testament scholars think best explain the book of Revelation. The first is shortly after Nero's death, around 68 to 70 AD. The primary argument on this side is that there's no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem or the temple within the book of Revelation. And Revelations 11, 1 through 2, seems to be hinting at the fact that Jerusalem might be under threat or attack, but the temple still stood as far as the author knew. Revelation 11, 1 reads, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the city for 42 months. This whole idea that he is told not to measure the outer courts because the nations will trample over it is seen as some sort of indication possibly to Rome's threat against the temple or that Rome has sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, but somehow God has preserved the Holy of Holies or the actual sanctuary of the temple itself. Then we have this infamous reference of 666 to Nero. Now there's been a lot of explanations as to how they get from this number to Emperor Nero. And some of them are very, very convoluted. And the problem is we're just not sure exactly how John was doing the math here and if it's a reference to Nero himself or not. It makes sense because you wouldn't come out and directly say that I'm speaking against Nero. If Nero was still alive, that would get you killed. But to make a numerical sort of reference to him would kind of hedge your bets and give you a little bit of safety here. I think it fits but I'm not going to bet my salvation on it. The truth is, we're really not sure what this 666 refers to. Revelation 13.3 may give us a better clue. In that text it reads, One of its heads seemed to have received a death blow, but its mortal wound had healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. Now there's this myth surrounding Nero. Nero was a really good emperor for the first half of his rule. But then in the second half, things really descended into all kinds of problems. In the end, he went crazy and committed suicide, or his generals actually helped him do this in order to restore order. A myth developed then off this that Nero would return to Rome and make Rome great again and restore it to its former glory and power. From 70 to 90 AD, there were at least three imposters who claimed to be Nero and attempted to gather the troops behind them in an order to take control of the throne in Rome. So that's the first time frame, somewhere around 70 AD and the death of Nero. The second time frame is during the 90s under the rule of Emperor Domitian. The church father Irenaeus thought that the book of Revelation was written very close to the end of Domitian's reign. And the church historian Eusebius followed Irenaeus' view as well when he wrote in the early 300 ADs. And I read from his quote earlier that John returned from the exile on the island after the death of Domitian. So what are some of the reasons why many people think that the book of Revelation is written in the 90s during the reign or shortly after the reign of Domitian? First, we have this view that Domitian claimed and insisted on being referred to as our Lord and God. Suetonius, Pliny the Younger, and Tacitus all back this up. However, many Roman historians 
think that about 10 years after Domitian died, Trajan, the new emperor, wanted to tear down the legacy of all those who preceded him. And so the story of Domitian insisting that he was to be called God was spread as a way to put him down. Look how nuts Domitian was that he insisted on this. Now, one of the things we do know is that Domitian ordered that a huge temple dedicated to Titus should be built in Ephesus, the temple of Sebastoi. While this order came from Rome, much of the financing and work would have to be done locally. A collection for this temple would have been issued within the region of the seven churches that this book refers to. Temples like this reinforced the power of Rome within that city, and they also demonstrated that region's loyalty to Roman rule. This parallels what we see in Revelation 13. Rome represents the beast that comes up out of the sea, but the second beast on the land represents the aristocrats and the wealthy who control the local economy and businesses within that region. Finally, open and active persecution against the church in the book of Revelation does not appear to have broken out yet. But in chapter 2, verses 10 and 13, it refers to future persecutions that are about to take place. John sees the threat which building this imperial temple and Domitian's order represents to the church. Things could easily get very, very tough for the churches in this area. Merle Tenney, in his New Testament introduction, writes that Revelation then is a witness to the growing hostility between the church and the Roman state. So we have two dates, around 70 AD or in the 90s, shortly after the death of Nero or during the reign or shortly after Domitian. This brings us then to the question of what type of book is Revelation? Now Revelation opens with the words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angels to his servant John. Now the word revelation, right at the very start here, is not a great translation. In fact, I have a video about William Tyndale and his translation of the Bible. And Tyndale seems to be responsible for introducing this reading to us. He wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we go back before him, John Wycliffe, he had the apocalypse of Jesus. The Greek word here is apocalypse. So what is an apocalypse? Well, an apocalypse overlaps with prophetic literature in certain areas, but there's important distinctions between them. Prophetic literature portrays God as accomplishing his divine plan or will through humans in history. Apocalyptic texts, by contrast, see God carrying out his plans through divine intervention in history. God will carry out his plans through supernatural means, People accomplish very, very little in apocalyptic texts. Now, one of the most important features of apocalyptic literature is offering to its readers hope during tough times. This hope is anchored in God and what God will do in the future and his reign in heaven above. Apocalyptic literature seems to have developed in ancient Persia or Babylon, and Israel most likely picked it up while they were in captivity in Babylon. The authors of the Old Testament used this genre of literature much like the authors in the New Testament adopted the conventions of letter writing from the Greco-Roman culture as they communicated to their churches, or like I'm trying to adapt and use YouTube now, but I'm not inspired in any way, shape, or form. I just thought I'd throw that little disclaimer in there for free. Apocalypses were written when their nation was invaded, their culture or religion was under threat, or they were undergoing very, very difficult situations. An apocalypse was written to meet these needs of the people. They projected a future where order would be restored through divine intervention. Now, I mentioned that Israel picked this up when they were in the Babylonian captivity. So if we look at books written during this time, we see it reflected in their text. Daniel, Ezekiel 38 through 48, Zechariah 1 through 6, Isaiah 24 through 7. These are all apocalyptic texts. In the New Testament, Mark 13, Matthew 24 and 25, 
1 Thessalonians 4 through 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 3 are all highly apocalyptic in tone. There are 14 apocalyptic texts written by Jewish authors prior to the birth of Jesus. And then we know of 24 that were written after the New Testament by both Jewish and Christian authors. Apocalyptic texts were a very, very popular form of religious literature. The problem is today is that we're not very familiar with them. So, what are the traits of an apocalypse? First, an apocalypse is characterized by dreams and visions, often very wild and fanciful ones. And these dreams often need to be interpreted or explained by an angelic messenger. In many of these texts, the person who receives the revelation is portrayed as some sort of significant person from the past, Abraham, Enoch, or Elijah. But that really doesn't fit with the book of Revelation. Second, apocalypse are often organized around two axes, a temporal axis and a vertical axis. The temporal axis presents this differentiation between the now of the readers of the text and the future. The vertical axis represents what the readers are experiencing here on earth and what is taking place in the heavenly realms. The primary purpose of Apocalypse is to show that God has all things under his control, despite how things may seem or appear in the here and now. On the vertical axis, our struggle here and now is seen as a reflection or a consequence of the conflict and struggles that are taking place above in the heavenly realms. Conflicts within the heavenly realm are reflected here on earth, but God is portrayed as restoring order in heaven, so we can trust him to do the same here. On the temporal axis, while evil may appear to flourish now, it will not be able to stand against God's actions in the future. While evil may appear to flourish now, it will not be able to stand against God's actions in the future. God is sovereign over history and creation. This present age will not last, and its end will soon come about. As a result, an apocalypse creates a strong expectation for what God will do in the future and it calls us to trust in him. It also calls the reader to remain faithful to the end, since that end is often portrayed as being just around the corner. Why is it important to understand what an apocalypse is? Well, Revelation is an apocalypse, and if we don't understand what this type of text is like, then we won't know how to read this book. All you have to do is do a search on YouTube for Revelation, and you'll see that there's a great deal of interest in this book. But often the people teaching on Revelation have very little idea or none at all about what an apocalypse is. Rather, they read it as some sort of coded text that's telling us about what is happening today or about to happen. World wars, the dangers of the UN, the Taliban, Islam, the list goes on and on and on. Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, or the Left Behind series, are classic examples of this approach. And we'll get into that more later on. As a result, an apocalypse like Revelation creates strong expectations in the reader about what God is going to do in the future and calls for us to trust in him. It also calls the reader to remain faithful to the end, since that end is often portrayed as just around the corner. I'm going to close on this note. An apocalypse like Revelation has incredible value and significance to our lives here and now. Perhaps no other book of the Bible has inspired our artists and authors as much as the book of Revelation has. Its ideas and themes have been extremely influential throughout history. Dante, John Milton, Handel's Messiah, movies like The Terminator, Planet of the Apes, Apocalypse Now, and perhaps the best of them all, Dr. Strangelove. Hymns like the Battle Hymn of the Republic and Onward Christian Soldiers also draw from the book of Revelation. So the better we understand this type of literature, the better we are equipped to engage works like these and their critique of our culture through their apocalyptic lens. 
Not only does Revelation motivate us by presenting a picture of the future and how God is totally sovereign, but it also calls us to be involved in issues that confront us today. Issues of social justice, equality, reconciliation, care for the world, climate change. The list goes on and on. Alan Bosak wrote a commentary on Revelation while living in South Africa under apartheid. It's entitled Comfort and Protest, a Commentary on Revelation by a South African. And he argues that the turmoil that John went through during his day was experienced by South Africans under apartheid. People were alienated and persecuted. Some were martyred. And he writes, to God alone belongs total allegiance. The people of God are called to resist social systems that dehumanize and imprison people, to resist and challenge religious institutions that become mouthpieces for propaganda rather than the proclaimers of the total message of God. In this way, apocalyptic literature continues to function as an instrument of hope and protest. I will leave him with the last word. More videos on Revelation are going to be coming in the next couple of weeks. So subscribe and hit that little bell icon. That way YouTube will notify you when I post new material. Until then, peace.